Welcome to the Reach the Stars podcast, a collection of conversations with cool people who do cool things. Brought to you by Papercraft Miracles. Each week, we'll bring you inspiring stories of persistence, passion, and purpose. With your host, Jonna Willoughby Lore. Welcome to the Reach the Stars podcast. I'm your host, John Willoughby Lore. And today, my guest is one of my heroes. I swear to God, I can't believe I'm talking to her on my podcast right now. Um, my guest today is Helen Hebert. If you have ever bought a book about paper making, it is a pretty good chance that she wrote it. Um, her book was my textbook in college. Um, she's like the hand paper making guru. She makes magical papers and magical books and all sorts of fun paper crafts and lamps and, and amazing things. And her life is super cool. So, um, with that, welcome to the show, Helen. Thank you so much for being here. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit more about you and, uh, and your magical paper journey? Sure. Thanks for having me, Jana. Super fun to be here. Um, yeah, well, I discovered paper in college. I was an exchange student in Germany. I was studying art at the University of the South, a small liberal arts school, and had the opportunity to spend my junior year abroad. And that was more of an art school where I went. It was in Mainz, Germany. And so I took classes that were all art classes, none of the other stuff. And they were all day long classes, very self-driven. And one of them was paper. And so I, that really opened my eyes to paper as a medium and a material because we, we made paper in a blender, but that didn't really excite me. What excited me was creating pop-ups and um, we had to make a piece of furniture from cardboard and uh, just the versatility of what you could do with paper, I found really cool. So after that, I went back, had to finish college at this small school in Tennessee. And um, actually on my way back from Germany, I visited New York City. Uh, my flight went through New York and I had a distant relative who I wrote a letter to, this was way back in the day, asking her if I could stay with her because she was the only person I even, I had never met her, um, knew in New York City, knew of. And she let me stay with her for, I don't know, I think I was there at least a week. And I fell in love with New York. It felt very European to me having just been in Germany. And I decided I was going to go there after college. So I did. And um I got there by getting a small grant from my college to work in a, a public program in New York. And um, the program I worked for was the Percent for Art program. Cool. Um, I had a professor in college who had just come from New York and had some connections. And so if I, I made the connection through him and then my college funded my experience. And that was just for four months. Looking back, that was like crazy. So I had four months of a sort of job. And then I had to figure out what I was going to do. And one thing led to another. I fell into the commercial printing world. So huge presses, manufacturing um, in downtown Manhattan. And I worked for this printer for a couple of years and then sort of moved towards graphic design, which was a little more creative. And then a couple of years later, my dad was in Japan one summer and my mom and I went to visit and we, I saw paper stores there. There were not paper stores that I knew of. I think New York Central was in, in New York. Of course it was, but I had never been there. Um, you kind of get in your little hole in New York and paper wasn't really on my radar. Uh, I mean, it was initially, but it wasn't at that moment. And so I I saw these papers at these paper stores and I knew paper was made in Japan. And um, so I was just there for two weeks on a trip. And I went, I went back to New York and started looking for ways to go to Japan to learn how to make paper. And little did I know that there was an amazing, couple of amazing paper studios right in the city. So I ended up um, finding Dudone Paper Mill and becoming an intern there for a short, short period and then working there for six years. And I, I didn't go back to Japan. I mean, I just stayed in New York. So cool. 
And so while you were working um, at that paper studio is when you got to be on Sesame Street, which is really fun. There's a really cool video of Helen making paper with a bunch of kids um, with a really fun kind of Johnny Cash style <laughs> country song about making paper on top of it on her website. I will link to that in the show notes so you can go check it out. It's really adorable. Um, so where did you end up uh, after leaving there? Yeah, so I worked there for six years and I met my husband in New York and um, we didn't want to raise a family there and we wanted to have kids. So we decided to move to Portland, Oregon. I remember we were actually having, we had a party where we were going to announce where we were going to move because it was like a big question mark. Um, we were debating between Colorado, which funnily enough, I live in Colorado now, and Oregon, and um, Oregon won at that point. So we moved to Oregon, and uh, he's he's a writer and editor, and so we were both, we neither of us had jobs lined up, didn't know where we were going to live. I mean, it was a little bit crazy looking <laughs> back on it, but um, it all worked out in the end. So we packed everything up. I had purchased some paper making equipment. Um, pretty much left the mill maybe six months earlier so that I could sort of get started on us moving. I was a little skeptical whether we would actually move. <laughs> so that kind of made my husband realize, okay, we're serious. We're doing this. And um, so we moved to Oregon and um, that's when I started. I just had my own studio. Um, eventually it took a while and um lived in Oregon for 14 years, had two children, um, sort of started establishing a business. I didn't really realize anything about business. Um, and then eight years ago, we moved to Colorado. And uh, that was mainly for my husband's work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of had to read up myself again. So now I'm in Colorado. Cool. And as anyone who's watching the video, you can see Helen's paper making studio behind her, which is so cool. I'm in it. I'm in it. Yeah. My, my studio is not nearly as photogenic, but uh, it's functional. So at least there's that. <laughs> um, so I love that you have this kind of paper was sort of following you around um, and showed up in different ways. And then you're like, you know, I'm going to do this. Um, how old were your kids when you when you started really making your paper business? Well, you know what? They weren't born yet. I mean, it really was, it did start in New York, but um, I just didn't realize I was running a business and I was by no means making <laughs> much money at it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a hard question to answer. So when I moved to Portland, I had my children pretty much right away. And um, I had already written um, one book came out before my son was born and the second one came out right after he was born. So that really, that, so I was, let's see. So I was writing the how-to books and um, I think I thought, oh, this is gonna put me on the map. It took a lot of uh, hard work to get on the map with those books. The mm. internet wasn't what it is today. Yeah. And um, it's paying off now though, you know, you know, all these years later that people are finding me because of my books. Um, and I was teaching and I really love to design products and projects. And early on, still when I was at the paper mill in New York, I thought that there weren't going to be enough people interested in paper making for me to make a living. So I better figure something else out. So I, that's when I got interested in making lamps and that trip to Japan, I stayed in an inn and the Japanese shoji screens and the light filtering through had really inspired me. Mm -hmm. So I kind of thought, you know, I don't, there aren't many books about how to make lamps. There aren't people teaching how to make lamps still today. There aren't very many. Um, so I added that to my repertoire and that made me a little more flexible in terms of teaching workshops and traveling places because there aren't always paper making studios and schlepping 
paper making equipment around gets old really fast. <laughs> I was doing that in Portland. And my husband was like, it's Helen's dog and pony show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just um, make pulp in the studio and just bring the bucket of pulp and a little, a little vat and just say, okay, we'll make paper here. I'll take it to my studio and I'll press it and I'll dry it. And then I'll send it to you in the mail. <laughs> Cause everybody ended up taking home their paper and it got all moldy cause they didn't know how to dry it. <laughs> Right. There's all those. I mean, I've done it every which way. Yeah. There's a lot of logistics. <laughs> so um, I like that you you were like, I'm going to work in this place and, and kind of get my get my expertise right. And then I'm going to write these books. And there's a lot of artists who would hesitate to write a book about something um, if they didn't feel like they were like a big time expert. And I'm curious if you had any of that, of like, am I, should I be writing this book? Like, I, I'm really glad that you did write the books, of course, because I use them all the time. Um, but I know that it's a, kind of a typical capital A artist thing to, to doubt that you're, you know enough for other people to, um, to learn from you. Yeah. And I'm curious if you, if you fall into that too. Oh, for sure. But you know what happened was an editor asked me whether I wanted to write a book. So that was a big difference maybe than me just putting it out there. Mm -hmm. So she already, not like she knew me, she, she saw a description of a workshop that I was teaching called compost paper making at the New York Horticultural Society. So I had started teaching in New York and she, based on that one paragraph description, she sent me a letter asking me whether I'd be interested in writing a book about making paper with plants. And, um, you know, at that point, like today, I probably would have said, you know, you should really talk to an expert and let me tell you who. But I was like wanting, I needed to like do something like that. I thought, wow. But sure, I had, I second guessed myself and I knew nothing about writing a book, but it just worked out. I had to write a proposal. I had to go through all the normal channels, um, but they accepted it. And then I remember going there, they brought me up to Massachusetts and this is story publishing. And um, I remember my editor asking me like, so how do you think you'll start <laughs> writing the book? And I don't know what I said. I don't think I, I don't think I said, I don't know, but that's what I was feeling. And she showed me some examples of other books. They were a gardening publisher and were branching out into crafts. So it was a good time because uh, this book was paper making with plants. And uh, so it kind of meshed their two ideas mm -hmm. um, of working with plants and doing craft. And so I decided the only way I could do that book was to talk to the experts. So that's what I did. I developed this survey that I sent out around the world, really. I mean, I was working at Dudenay, so I had really good connections. Mm -hmm. um, they knew everybody in the papermaking world. So uh, I sent this survey and got people to contribute recipes and tell me how they did different aspects of the papermaking process. And that was really enlightening because I thought, you know, I think I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to write, this is how you make paper, this is how you dry paper, this is how you prepare fiber, but everybody had a different way. Mm -hmm. So that was really like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna put this in a book? But it worked out, I figured it out and I just told lots of different ways to do each step in the process. Cause not everybody has the same equipment or uh, can't get water on their floor, you know, all kinds of things. So yeah, it's, it's such a helpful book too. And I know that there's been a lot of times that I'll have a client email me and say, Hey, can you make this? And I'm like, totally. And I'm like, I'm going to get out Helen's book, find out how to make this because I've never done it before and um, just kind of wing it. So it's, it's, it's cool that your book kind of, you know, helps me feel like an expert when I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so once you moved to, to Colorado and I kind of revamped your, your, paper business. Um, what things did you change when you kind of got to switch it around a little bit? How did you change it? Yeah, well, what I realized, because I live outside of Vail, Colorado, so it's a, it's a rural community. I mean, it's a resort area, lots of skiing, but it's pretty 
rural and remote, two hours from Denver. Um, and I didn't really know how I would do what I was doing in Portland, which was teaching at different places. And I had a big art community there. I was able to get grants to do some of my projects. And that felt like it was going to be really different here. So I decided to work on my online, um, reach out to, to everyone online. And I had... I've worked with various coaches over the year, over the years, artist coaches, business coaches. And I had worked with one in Portland who had suggested I start an email newsletter. So this was maybe 15 years ago. So I've been doing that for 15 years and building up my following and sort of just telling people what I'm doing, um, where I'm traveling, you know, making connections mm -hmm. and, um, so that was, you know, I already had that base. And uh, because I lived in a resort community, I thought, well, maybe I could have a retreat here. And I found this amazing studio, by the way. This is not in the resort area. It's just far enough away where it is super affordable. And it's in an old schoolhouse in this tiny town called Red Cliff. And I have an old kindergarten room. People have come and visited and said, oh, I was, I took, I was here in kindergarten or I taught here. <laughs> sweet. Um, so I launched that about two years after we moved here and um, filled that. So I filled a retreat every year until this year, which is COVID. Yeah. So I had to cancel in-person things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I just, um, I started my blog here. So I have a weekly blog called The Sunday Paper where I feature people working in paper. And then I also talk a little bit about what's going on in my stu studio every week. Um, a couple years ago, I started a podcast. John has been on the podcast um, called Paper Talk. And so, yeah, I just really, and then four years ago, I, I saw other people teaching online. I just thought, you know what? How could I ever do that? But I had the how-to books. I know how to write the content and put it together. And I figured out the video part. That was what I was kind of scared of. But um, so I started teaching online classes and that has been a really good income stream. And then the, the artwork that I make, I do some installations and I've done one that I sold to a library in Denver. That was a very cool project, but um, I love doing those, but they're a lot of work and, uh, and often I don't sell them. So there's no financial gain. Um, you're like, where am I gonna put this giant thing? I don't yeah. know. Yes, I, I certainly have my stockpile of yeah. unsold installations in the back of my studio. <laughs> yeah, but I do, I started making artist books back in Portland. And I thought that could be an income stream and that has proven to be a really good one. So I make one every couple of years and I'm they're limited edition, high price. I sell them to special collections, libraries at universities and other places. And there are dealers that help me sell them. So that's really uh, a, one of my passions. <sighs> That's like my, that's on my bucket list, like figure out how to make small editions of artist books and sell them because uh, as soon as I first learned what an artist book was and I was like, oh, it's the answer. Like <laughs> I've been wanting to find a way to take like poetry and, and visual art and structure and sculpture and experience and make it all come together to make one bigger concept or a bigger idea. And I've started doing some, they're, to me, I still think they feel like artist books. Like I'll do uh, a work made of paper and I'll have a poem that goes with it, but I'll do a video of all of it together. So it's not a physical, tangible book in the same way, but it, uh, it makes the point come across in the same way where it's like the visual art and the words and the experience all goes together. Cause it was like, oh, I want to make so many of these. <laughs> yeah, it's really all encompassing. Yeah. And I feel I wanted to be an architect as a kid. And I feel like and then I worked for an architect and I was naive. I just thought, oh, my gosh, it's going to take me so long until I could actually be an architect. Well, little did I know it would take me so long to do anything. Right. <laughs> but I feel like, oh, now I can in my artist books, I'm 
doing architecture on a different scale. Yeah, exactly. You know, just you kind of think of this idea in your head and you say, okay, well, if you add these papers in this way and fold it in this way, then it could close all the way and still open and be really big. Like I just, I love kind of mapping out the structure of how you can put something together and like making a little dummy model out of scrap paper and post-its and like taping it together and say, is it really going to work if I do this? And um, I think that my favorite thing about all, all book arts in general is that the basic techniques of any of it are pretty easy for people to learn and you can kind of it's more of a science uh, the techniques of how you do things and then the art part is what you do with it once you know those basic techniques and how you can put them together and um it just like you were talking about how paper is just so versatile it's just you can do so many things with it it's you know it's right and not just talking about every word so adding the content and um mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, it's a really rich experience, I find. Yeah, and I, I, do, I love being able to stretch the idea of what people would think of as a book. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously, probably 95% of the world, when you say book, they think, oh, a codex. Like, they don't know to call it that. But that's what they're like, oh, it's a case-bound codex. That's a book. But, you know, I just love crazy wild accordion books that just open and open and open it <laughs> you're like how did that all fit in there or a book that comes in a box and the box falls apart and then a book shows up and oh it's so fun it's so fun all the things you can do to it um so i wanted to, i wanted to talk to you a little bit about um life during covid um and what your kind of quarantine was like and and what sort of pivots you did aside from adding more online courses and stuff like that. Um, so what's it been, what's it been like for you out there in Colorado? Yeah, it's actually been really good for me. Um, I'll, my husband did lose his job. So, you know, there's the ups and downs, but my business is going well. He's able to freelance some too. So it's not crazy bad, but um but it was directly related to COVID. Um, so I actually had an online class scheduled to start in April. So I was just starting to market it in March when everything went crazy. And I really debated, I think I had a 20 students signed up and I thought, you know, I could just run it with that. Maybe I shouldn't be marketing into this unknown but I just decided, no, come on, this is what you were going to do. So just do it. And I ended up with like 60 or 70 students in the class. So it was good. And people were looking for something to do online mm -hmm. and with their hands and creative. So I think that worked out really well. And then I did have my retreat scheduled and pretty much filled for September. And I had just added, of course, this was the year two master classes that I was going to do in my studio with four people each. I had sold out, you know, so those were going to happen in June and July. And so I had to go through, okay, what am I going to do? No, I can't, I can't do those. I had to refund. That was like $20,000 in refunds. That was oh, like, ow. <laughs> brutal. Oh man. So, but I, then I thought, okay, how, how can I replace that income? And I did, I, I decided to run a new online class called Paper and Light, which was this summer and it was a little longer. I did it two sessions, two four week sessions. Usually I have a six week online class and that was really successful. Um, and then I had a bunch of travel planned for this fall. I was gonna actually go to Japan um, and some other things and um, uh, obviously that's not happening. So I, um, I have an online class going right now, just started yesterday called the handmade holiday series. And it's more these little projects that I've designed like cards, ornaments and holiday decor and lanterns. So every week we're going to do three different projects and, the, they all pretty much collapse flat or they're really lightweight. So you could send them to someone and as a holiday, get small gift. And so it's just started and um, I think it'll be really fun. <laughs> um, 
I work alone in my studio. So I was fortunate I could always come up here. Um, so I never really stopped working. Yeah, I definitely didn't stop working. I was working like a crazy person because my studio is right downstairs in my house. So I was like, well, I don't even have to go outside. <laughs> Super right. low risk for me. But I, I do have staff and my staff was I was trying to find things for them to do at home when they couldn't come to the studio. And it was just starting to sort of not be winter here <laughs> in like end of March. And I remember sending my assistant home with a giant bucket of pulp and a screen. I'm like, go make some seed bombs at home. Dry them in your kitchen. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to find things for them to do. So, man, was I happy for phase one to start. Because since we count as manufacturing, as soon as it was phase one, I was allowed to have my staff back in the studio, which was great. Yeah. It's, been a, it's been an interesting summer and fall. Uh, everybody working with their masks on all the time. <laughs> um, so is there any, any other big projects that you have in, in the wings or things that you're like, someday I wanna do this? Yeah, well, I do have through all of this also, I had a book deadline. So I haven't written a book in almost 10 years but I've had this idea for a long time to write a book um, featuring projects that can be made with one sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And so my deadline was early April. So that kept me focused through March and, um, and then throughout the summer and actually the photo shoot is happening right now in Massachusetts. Again, same publisher storybooks. Um, so that's given me something to do and I'm looking forward to that coming out in, it's going to be another year next fall. Um, and then I, I actually just did an online residency teaching a group. Someone heard about me and had just started uh, doing a paper making program at his school in Arkansas with 16, six to nine year olds and asked me to come in as the expert, but virtually. And that was really uh, interesting. Like they had made their own molds and decals and I had to figure out sort of what their setup was and then how to show them. And so there was, I think it went really well. I met with the teacher every week for an hour or so just to go over, okay, this is what we're gonna do next week, how he should get set up. And, and then I had to pivot a little bit based on how they were set up and, um, it was really fun. They, they did some great work. I had to like, look at them, you know, 16 on the screen. I didn't realize that I could like pin each kid for a week or two. So I could like look at up close at each kid cause they had a laptop at their station. So I could look at each kid working. So that was just a fun new experience. And, you know, made me realize sort of what's possible. Maybe I could come up with some other programs. Um, and then I have one artwork that my artworks take a long time. So I'm working on a new artist book, but I'm also working on a sculptural lamp. I want to, I want to make a big light that you can actually stand inside of. Yeah, oh, so cool. And I want it to have a component that you reflect about like um how you're visible or something to do with light, you know, and who you are in the world and um, it would be collapsible. So it would maybe be, it's like a big paper tube that you pull down or pull up around you. And so I'm, I kind of have a model going and I'm, I'm excited about it, but I'm not working on it actively at the moment. Yeah. That sounds so cool. I can't wait to see it. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit more about your, your online workshop style. Um, do you do more kind of pre-recorded videos and then just let people buy them and do them on their own time? Or do you say this class meets every week at this time or something like that? How do you typically set them up or a mixture of both? Yeah, it's a combination. So, um, what I've done up until now is everything's pre-recorded. So I have a video and I also have a handout that you can download that has the instructions. 
And then I set up, I use the platform called Rizuku and I set up all of the sessions and they deliver once a week. So every week there's a new lesson. And so people have access to the video and the handout and any templates and they work on their own, but we have an online classroom where they can ask questions, post images, um, and so there's no live component, but with this workshop I'm doing now, I'm doing an experiment where I'm, I'm going to have two Zoom calls. Mm -hmm. And so the first one is next Monday, so about a week after class started, and then another two weeks, so when the class is almost finishing. And I'll do a little demo. Um, I've got like a tripod I can put my phone on, so I'll be signed on on my phone and my computer so they can see me and then see what I'm doing with my hands. And then we'll, um, I'll answer any questions. People can show what they've been working on. Yeah, so that's an experiment. And then actually I do something else. I, I, I published something called the 12 months of paper or the paper year for the past five years. It's a physical product that I printed and sent out and it features a project every month. Um, but in 2021, the paper year is going online. So it's going to be like a year long online class. So every month there'll be a new project and I have some guest artists and we'll meet monthly on Zoom for just, uh, here's what I've been making. It's gonna be the same format as always, a video and a PDF and a classroom that you can post whenever you want to online. But then every month there'll be a Zoom session and some other fun things. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. That's awesome. So do you put together um, like supply kits for people when they buy stuff or do they just have to kind of go find all their own stuff or how does that work? That was a big stumper in the beginning. So that's why I didn't do them for a while. Cause I thought the first class I did was paper illuminated different lighting structures. And I was like, nobody's going to want to buy all these supplies because I had to get them from different s suppliers. You can't get everything in one place and you need paper and lamp parts. And uh, so I did start out producing kits and I would say 95% of the students bought the kits. And then I, it's a lot of work to produce those <laughs> and sell them. Oh, yes. I mean, I make, I charge more, so I make something on it, but it's a pain to put them together. So I've been gradually trying different things. Um, and that paper and light class this summer, I I had an extensive supply list and I did not supply anything. People had to get everything on their own. Um, I have partnered with paper companies for the paper part. So I've chosen papers and then the paper company puts together the kit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people buy that, but then they had to source everything else. But I give them where to find it. And it seems to be working out. Um, I mean, I love to support small businesses, but Amazon's really easy for that kind of thing. So I was able to put an Amazon shop together where if you just want to shop in one place, you could get almost everything aside from the paper. Yeah. And I guess yeah. if you're going to buy through Amazon, you can buy through the small sellers on Amazon. It does help all the small sellers too. Um, it's not only giving money to Jeff Bezos. <laughs> it's five question time. It's five question time. So at the end of all the podcasts, I ask all of my guests the same five questions because I really love to hear how different people answer the same questions in different ways. So the first one is tell me about an experience or a single moment that you had that changed who you are today. Yeah, I was like, ah, I don't want to get that kind of question. Um, <laughs> so, well, you know what? I did a bicycle trip across the country when, in my 20s. It was right before I started working at Dudonay Paper Mill. And um, maybe even before I went to Japan. I can't remember. It was somewhere in there where I was really trying to figure out what I was doing. And this was a trip where you had to raise money. It was through an organization called Bike Aid. And I had to raise $2,000 for that organization. They funded um, grassroots community development projects around the world. It was started by these two brothers 
from Bangladesh who went to Harvard and were just shocked at how little, probably nobody knew where Bangladesh was. You know, that started, it started there and then just escalated that, oh, they don't realize, you know, how the world is. And so they were trying to educate people through this trip across the country. So we rode across the country and we did, we, we stayed in communities, people hosted potlucks. Um, it was a great experience, but the raising the money was also really uh, empowering. It really taught me, wow, that I could raise money. I, I put together this letter that had a cool bicycle wheel that spun on it and um, sent it out to people. But I also went around in my community and asked people to donate. And, and so I was just talking about what I was doing. So I went to the, I had to go to the dentist, I remember. And I told him and he said, oh, don't, you don't have to pay today. Just put that money towards your trip. And um, that was, that really changed my perspective um, and helped me realize that I could, I could do this. When I went on the trip, actually, I realized many of the people hadn't raised the money. But so I felt- really And you were like, oh, money. I didn't know there was an option not to raise the money. <laughs> Number two, when you feel defeated or overcome, what do you tell yourself to keep going? Okay, well, I think more than something I tell myself is I give myself a break. I take a pause. And I keep doing what I normally do. I get up at the same time. I go to the gym. I take care of myself. And, um, you know, I find times like that. I start, it's, it's kind of like artist block too, when I don't have an idea. I just, it comes. Things shift around and I get back on track. Cool. So it's more of a behavior than... Maybe I'm telling myself something, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm telling yourself this too, this too will pass. I'll just keep on trucking, I guess. But number three, tell me about a way that you overcame a failure or a mistake and what you learned from it. Okay. I'm going to give you a small example. The first thing that came to mind was uh, something that happened yesterday in my online class. Um, a student wrote that one of my templates was wrong for one, for one of the projects in the class. And this is like the first day of a new class and I just was mortified. But I think the more, the older I get, the more mistakes have happened. I can let them run off my back a little easier. So I'm like, okay, how do I move forward? Just keep moving forward. So I apologized and um, looked at the template and realized the mistake and, you know, realized, oh, I probably should have tested making the project with the actual template because I had someone else draw the template for me mm -hmm. and I hadn't caught her mistake. So I was able to, thankfully I was able to fix it. I know Adobe Illustrator enough that I could fix it and got the right template into the classroom, probably before most people had even made the project, but and I apologized and said that I hoped that I hadn't caused anyone too much trouble. The person who made the project said she actually figured out what was wrong before she made a mistake. So that was nice too. Yeah. But yeah, mistakes happen all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. Number four, what one trait or habit is most responsible for keeping you on track? Um, I would say consistency, just, uh, keeping, keeping going. And, you know, as an artist, I finally learned how to, um, how to run a business and do business like things. Um, I, you know, I love to do new things and I think that's a big part of creativity. And so I was always reinventing the will wheel and I didn't have systems in place uh, so that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel every time I taught a new workshop. Like there's certain things that I do or every time I have an online paper sale. So yeah, I think um, I figured out how to couple 
consistency, the business running part with creativity. And that's really exciting. Yeah, that's my constant struggle, too. It's like, oh, I want to start this new thing. And then you have to kind of figure out, is it even going to work, let alone, you know, how you're going to repeat that and change it and keep going with it without totally being burnt out as hell and thinking it's boring. (laughs) Okay. Well, our internet is decently good right now. Number five, what's the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? And what advice would you give other people? Oh my gosh. Well, (laughs) I think I already said this, the, you know, the piece of advice from this coach to start an email newsletter was so key to where I am today um, because it really just helped me build my network slowly but surely and has that is where I announce new programs my online classes that's where I get my students that's where I sell almost everything so that was really a great piece of advice and Advice I would give, um, I just had someone come to my studio last week who's kind of in her early 20s trying to figure out what to do. And um, let's see, what did I tell her? A couple of things. Um, Well, I think just to keep at it, for me, looking back, that is, you know, I knew I wanted to work with paper. I had no idea how, and I took many detours, but I kept my eye on the prize and I kept, it just worked out. And another thing that coach, same coach told me was don't take no for an answer. Just, uh, it means turn another direction. So if someone says no, then you're like, okay, well, how else could I do this? And I think that that's a really valuable piece of advice that I would give to people because I, um, I have been persistent and have figured out a way when there wasn't one, I just figured out another way. I love that. Me too. (laughs) Uh, You know, I think when you, when you want to be an artist and make a living as an artist, the world is just so, I don't know why the world thinks this way, but the world is like, oh, if you enjoy what you do and you really truly love your work, then why should you also get paid a good amount of money to do that? And, you know, I think it's just, just people who don't love their work are just pissed (laughs) that other people get to do that. And I think that it's, it's so important for artists to realize that your work is valuable and, you know, what more than COVID for people to realize how important it is to have um, music and art and, and movies and TV and like people who do those creative things that, that bring you joy every day um, and that connect people and give you things to talk about and, and ways to, to be connected. If, if the artists weren't doing all that, the world would suck. (laughs) And uh, yeah, but if, for artists that do have to make a living, it's not all fun and games. That's the flip side is those people think we are just having fun, loving what we do. Yes, but it's we still have to do the bookkeeping and clean the toilets and all that part. You know, yeah, so it's take out the trash. And- it's, it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Sweep the floor, clean the studio, yeah. <laughs> bleach the buckets, you know. <laughs> exactly the marketing yeah Mm yeah Yeah. um so that was the end of my questions do you have anything else you want to add hopefully our internet doesn't freeze again (laughs) i mean i probably most of your people don't make paper i don't know i've listened to a bunch of your podcasts and i think uh paper making is a really unique thing and it's fun and if you can find your own unique niche um, there's a lot of possibilities. You have to run with them and find them because paper making is such a small field. I really feel like I had to to hustle a bit to figure out how to make it, which you've done too. Um, but I think there's so much potential in the world to do cool and fun things. And I love that you're featuring people that do things like that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I love that this podcast is kind of the the space where all of my creative outlets meet. So I've got my my paper buddies that come on here and talk about you know making cool things. I've got other creative entrepreneurs. I've got musicians and poets, and it's just it's cool to have a space for all of these amazing people that I know to meet each other and connect with each other and they might not ever have a chance to do that if they weren't um connecting on the podcast so i'm glad that it exists for that and um so yeah before our internet get, internet gets terrible again thank you so much helen for being on my show um can you tell everyone where they can find you on the interwebs yeah I'm at HelenHebertStudio.com, and that's H-I-E-B-E-R-T. And Helen is with one L. I'm appalled at how many people think it's like the word hell, but it's not. <laughs> so, um, and I'm on Instagram as Helen Hebert. I have a Facebook group called The Paper Studio. And, um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I will link to all of those in the show notes. Um, so please go and, and check out her site and connect with Helen and, and make sure you watch that video of her making paper on Sesame Street because it is the cutest thing ever. And thank you so much for being on the show today. And if you love this podcast, please go to www.patreon.com slash reach the stars and become a patron. You get fun little perks and you get to see the blooper reels and funny things that happen. Um, and you get to watch the show a day earlier than everybody else does. Oh, so exciting. And if you could review us on iTunes, that would make my little podcasty heart happy because then iTunes will show it to more people who might never hear about it. So thanks so much for being on the show, Helen. And I hope everyone has a fantabulous week. Bye. A single interaction has the power to change your life forever. This is a place for the stories of those moments. Stories of pursuing dreams, overcoming tragedy and failure, of coming back to life after so much of what feels like dying, of continuing on with only a vision as a map. This is the place where those moments live on. Come sit by the fire, look up at the stars, and be forever changed too. Thank you for being with us on the Reach the Stars podcast. Our theme music is generously provided by Byrocratic. You can find him on bandcamp.com. Thank you to all of our current patrons, guests, and everyone else who helps make this dream a reality. We are so proud to be building this amazing community with all of you. If you love this podcast, please consider sharing with a friend, leaving a review on iTunes, and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash reach the stars. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to see the videos of these conversations. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, do something cool and tell us about it.